Hi guys, it's Mr. with you again. I'm going to be talking about another AP review topic for AP chemistry. This time we're going to talk about mass spectrometry. So this is a mass spectro spectrophotometer here, um, or what we call a mass spec. This is a very simplified version you're seeing right here. Uh, it consists of an evacuated glass tube filled with nothing. Obviously it's a vacuum. And we're injecting some sample into it. So over here you're going to see the sample. So it could be a mixture, it could be a compound, it could be an element. And we're going to put it in there and it's going to be heated and vaporized. So there's a heating element inside right here that is going to heat up the sample. It's going to not only vaporize it but also ionize it. That is it's going to give it a charge. And then the ions that are created are going to be accelerated through this so they're shot down through the tube and it's going to pass through a magnetic field and as it passes through the magnetic field a moving charge is going to experience a force so the force that's going to be on that charged particle is going to be dependent on the charge so the all these particles going through if we assume they have the same charge they'll all be experiencing the same force however different mass particles and you'll see this is shown by a thicker line has a higher mass is going to be deflected less because as Newton's law tells us force equals mass times acceleration the bigger the mass the less the acceleration it's going to experience and so the bigger particles aren't deflected as much and the smaller particles are deflected more and there's a little detector over here which is going to measure the amount of that deflection and be able to measure the mass so what this does is it tells you the mass of different particles and how many of each of those different mass particles you're going to have well in reality this is more what the machine looks like in a real version so this is a setup for a gas chromatograph mass spec so a gas chromatograph if you remember chromatography it separates mixtures in this case we have a gas tank over here right and that tank is going to send our mixture through and it's going to separate whatever our compounds are in that mixture and it's going to feed those compounds into a mass spec so the GC separates mixtures for us and then the mass spectrometer tells us what those are and you'll see that there's a readout up here which I placed in and it gives us this nice little readout so what we wind up with is things like a bar graph that shows us the amount of each thing that came through now what does that look like so here would be a mass spectrum of neon so obviously neon this is just an element and what you're gonna see is that there's some different peaks you're gonna see this in the form of a bar graph so we have a peak here we have a peak over here we'll see this one now we're gonna look at how this comes out in table form so in a table form if we were to see what this data tells us is that there's actually three different particles that come out three different masses so one is neon 20 one's neon 21 and one is neon 22 and we're gonna see that those each have different masses so neon 20 weighs 19.99 neon 21 let's say it weighs 20.99 and this would be the neon 22 and these come out in different abundances and where we get that is from the height of those peaks so when we come back here if we look at the height of the peaks the relative heights of the peaks and for whatever reason they always set the highest one at a hundred percent and we compare that to the other ones we come back over here you'll see boom that these abundances right 90.92 percent 0.257 and 8.82 these are the abundances so most neon is neon 20. well these isotopes what we're going to look at is try and figure out well you know what would the average be if we brought all of these together looking at those components so what does a sample problem look like with this so let's say i ran into this one we have some unknown substance and we look at its mass spectrum and it tells us that the substance is 60.10 percent uh, one particular isotope that's m69 and 39.9 percent some other isotope which is m71 m is obviously just standing for some metal the mass values for m69 and m71 are 68.93 and 70.92 what's the average atomic mass and what is the element so how are we going to approach this problem 
we're going to take that data and we're going to start by writing the masses of these. So the two things we have are M69, right? The lighter isotope and we have M71. The mass of each one, so let's start with this one, we, it says is 68.93 AMUs. I'm just going to write the number. And this one's going to be 70.92. Okay. Well, what do we do to get the average? Well, we then are going to take those numbers and we're going to multiply by their relative abundance because the average atomic mass is the relative weight. So the weights for each one, because they're not equal quantities of each one, and divide them. We have to multiply them by the number that are present. So if we look at the percent that's present, well, for the first one, the 68.93, the percent abundance is 60.10%. So we're going to multiply by 0.6010. Zero, the percent expressed as a decimal. And we actually call this the relative abundance, not the percent abundance. This is the relative abundance. All right, that's the other one, 0 0.3990, 0 0.3990. Well, you're gonna get out your handy dandy calculator we're going to do a little bit of math and figure out what those come out to be. When we multiply those, we get 41.43. And the other, we get 28.30. And when we add those together, we're going to come up with our total, which is 69.73. So that answers the first part of the question. That's our average atomic mass. And what is the element? Well, what's the element? You're going to go to your periodic table and look up what it is. So the only one that is close to that is gallium. GA. Okay. So I could definitely see that being a problem. Now, if you had more than one isotope, you would just do this multiple times. Instead of just doing it for two isotopes, you could do it for three or four or five or six, however many there are. As long as you know the data, you'll be able to plug it in and get your final answer. The other way to take this problem, I've also seen this done the other way. If you have the relative abundances, or rather if you have the masses of each and you have the average, can you go back and get what the relative abundances are? So this is taking the problem and kind of flipping it on its head. This can really only be done for isotopes where you only have two isotopes for that particular element. Otherwise, it's really not gonna work for you. So what are we gonna do? So let me flip back. So in this case, it's indium 113 and 115. Well, how are we gonna approach this? They give us the masses of each right here. So it's telling us what the masses of each one and we know the average. We're going to have to do a little bit of algebra. So let's say indium 113. We'll take that one to start with. So let's assign its relative abundance some kind of a number. Let's just say it's x. So let's say the relative abundance of this one is going to be x. So indium 115, we're going to call that Y. Well, what do we know about these? What we know is that if I add up X, the relative abundance of indium, and the relative abundance of indium 115, we're going to add up the two isotopes, those have to sum up to a total of one, right? They have to add up to a total of 100%. So, we could also describe this one as one minus x. Right, that's another way to write it. Well, what else do we know? We know that if we multiply the relative abundance of indium-113, which is x, times its mass, and we know that its mass is 112. 
0.9043. That's from right up here. And we add that to the relative abundance of indium-115, which we called Y, times its mass, we're going to pull that down, is 114.9041. We're going to equal the total. And what's the total? Well, it tells us in the problem what the average is, right? So the average atomic mass is 114.82. That's what we did in the previous problem. We multiplied the relative abundance times the mass, this relative abundance times the mass, and we got the average. So now we just don't know what they are. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna substitute in the one minus x for our y. So I'm gonna rewrite this equation. Obviously this is gonna give us still x times 112.9043 plus, well now what do we got here? Now let's expand this out. This is x or one minus x, right? Times 114.9041. And that's gonna equal our final 114.82. So we're gonna distribute right here And let me just switch my colors to all black, and we're going to go to this one, which is going to give me 112.9043x plus, what are we going to get over here? This is going to be 114.9041 minus 114.9041x is equal to 114.82. What you're going to do is you're going to combine like terms. We have x's here and x's here. We're going to bring this constant right here to the other side by subtracting from both. And when you do your algebra, you should wind up with your x equaling 0.042. That's what you're going to get. Well, what does that mean? Let's come back up to the top here. That means the relative abundance of indium, which we called our x, is 0 0.042. Right? x is 0 0.042. And it told us that 1 minus x was equal to y. y was our relative abundance of indium 115. So if we do 1 minus that, that's going to give us 0.95. Eight for our relative abundance of indium-115. If we wanted to turn that into a percent, because the problem says, what is the percent? Well, we just multiply by 100. So indium-113, indium-113 is going to be 4.2%. And our indium-115 is therefore going to be 95.8%. And we know that we did our job right because these two are going to add up to be 100%. Okay? One last problem that we could see. So let's look at a slightly more complicated uh, mass spectrum. So in this case, we've got bromine. So bromine, right, is a diatomic element. And when bromine is injected into the mass spectrometer, what we get is not just one peak. We actually get five peaks. And bromine only has two naturally occurring isotopes. It's got bromine-79 and bromine-81. So the question asks, can you explain why there are five different peaks? Why would we wind up with five different peaks instead of just two different peaks for something like bromine? Well, what you have to think about is what are the possible combinations you can have? You have a bromine molecule, right? So bromine molecule, if we look, we wind up with peaks at 79 and 81 down here, right? That makes sense. Those are our two different isotopes, right? So I've got just a single 
bromine 79. I could also wind up with just a single bromine 81 when I do the mass spectrum. But I could also wind up with a molecule containing these different isotopes. So this is where these three peaks are going to come in here. It looks like most of the bromine that came through because the height of these peaks was actually molecular bromine. So your two bromines connected together, right? We could have a 79 and a 79. We could have another one, which is bromine 79 and 81. We could have a bromine 81 first, and then a bromine 79. And finally, we could have a bromine, whoop, that's a bromine, 81, and a bromine 81 connected together. Well, what's going to happen? If you have a 79 and a 79, that's going to give you 158. If you have an 81 and 81, that's going to give you 162. And you'll actually see that it looks like we get about twice as much of the bromine 79 81 combination because there's two different ways we could put that together. And so that's why you wind up with five different peaks. And if we look down here, well, what does that mean? It looks like, I guess, since these are the same height, bromine 79 and bromine 81 are about a 50 50 mix. So that's one more way that you could look and have to analyze a mass spectrum. And I'll see you again next time.